And the subtitle of the book is The Unwritten Rules, Misperceptions, and Secret Beliefs of Men in the Workplace. What are those things that would really help if we knew them? Basically, think of it as if you are going to do business in Japan or other cultures. Do you guys do business globally at all? Do you have any clients who of other cultures? And Yeah, okay. So if you're going to go do business in Japan or Latin America or the Middle East, you don't assume that you know everything about how they privately think. You study it and you think, okay, you know, I need to know how, if I say this or if I do this, how that's going to be perceived. And you sort of expect that when you go do business in another culture. And what I've realized is it's not talked about, but internally there is an internal male culture and an internal female culture and a way that we as women and they as men privately have these expectations and perceptions. And it's the same thing. We need to work to understand each other in order to do business well with that culture. Please listen to what I'm saying. Think about whether any of it could be affecting you, how you can take some of this knowledge that you're going to have about the private thoughts and the sort of the candid feelings and sometimes misperceptions that men tend to have that they rarely say. Take some of that and see if any of it applies to you and what you might want to do about it. Some of you will walk out going, okay, I'm glad I know it, but it really doesn't affect me. It's not an issue for me. That's great. You know what? It may not affect you, but if you're a manager, it could also affect the people that you manage. It could affect your working relationship with your clients. The survey, when I talk about the survey that I did, I did all these interviews and then I also did several scientific nationally representative surveys that cost me boatloads of money um, and uh, were really, really reliable and they were designed in context. My survey design consultant was the guy who used to be chief of the survey design at the Census Bureau and the whole point was to try to get something really reliable on these issues that it's really hard to get at sometimes. So I'm really comfortable with the data and, and two-thirds of the men said, yeah, this really is an issue that there really are ways they see really talented women not being as effective as they might otherwise be, or ways that if those women knew this, they could remove an obstacle that they didn't even know was there and be that much more, their trajectory would be that much better. In a man's mind, you, because it is so different, the environment has changed around you, one of the rules is that when you cross that bridge, you kind of leave your personal feelings completely aside because it's not this view. You leave your personal feelings totally aside. You shouldn't even have the same feelings. For example, if you get criticized, if something gets criticized, it's not Bob criticizing Shanti. It's the vice president criticizing the director of marketing. Why are you taking this personally? Because it's not you. Okay, You become your position. Another one that has huge implications for us as women is actually what they view as jumping to conclusions. Remember I said our brains are wired to be able to process a lot really quickly all at once? Our, that's the way our physical brain structure is wired to be able instead of going deep at one thing at a time to be able to really quickly zip through all the alternatives and think you know what this feels like, you know, okay, we have A, B, C, and D. Well, A won't work because of this, B won't work because of this, C might just work, and D probably not so much. And your brain does it like that, right? Malcolm Gladwell's Blink book. It's a quick process. Because men's brains aren't wired that way, if you just come out with, well, this won't work because of this, but C might work, you start hearing things like, well, let's not jump to conclusions. Let's not be hasty about this. I don't know if you've ever heard this. I heard this a lot. <laughs> Let's not be hasty. And that's a signal that a guy is thinking this can't possibly have been based on logic, so therefore it's based on emotion. Counterproductive, not thinking. In a woman's brain, believe it or not, when we see an attractive member of the opposite sex, our thinking centers light up, our cortical areas, and we think, huh, He's an attractive man. Okay, it's a very thinking-oriented response. It's not this gut-level, fantasized kind of response. So, so, which, by the way, is very disappointing to most men to know, by the way. <laughs> They're like, really? <laughs> and, um, 
And so that difference, so a woman is just dressing to be trendy, you know, trying to wear what's in style, and the man is thinking, why is she wearing that low-cut top, and why does she want me to fantasize about her in the office? I mean, seriously, this is what's going on in their heads. And the other problem is, okay, because it kicks them back to this very sort of subterranean, instinctive, sexual thing back in the brain, they have to immediately if they don't want to go that direction, which most men don't, because they want to respect the women that they work with and whatnot, they have to instantly exert their the cortical areas, have to take over their thinking cortex, and they have to pull those thoughts back, and they have to force themselves to wrench their thoughts away from where their brain wants to go. And so essentially, here's what's happening. When they see the woman, she's standing up at the whiteboard, and she's making a presentation, and she's wearing a low-cut top. The guy is spending the whole time going, look at her face, look at her face, look at her face. <laughs> <laughs> and he's missing some of what she's saying. He doesn't want to, but it's a function of him trying to wrench his thoughts back on track. And I, and I asked him, what can you say instead? If it's, if it's the why questions and that kind of thing that triggers this, is she challenging me? Does she think I don't know what I'm doing thing? What do you say instead? And this guy looked at me like, the answer should be so obvious, like I had two heads. He was like, how different would it be if you essentially just, instead of saying, why did you choose that pricing, if you essentially said, help me understand your reason for that pricing? It's asking the same question, but it's basically, it's assuming that I have a reason and I'm not an idiot. So many guys said, please tell your female readers they don't have to be like a man. They can just be themselves. And I said, okay, um, you're, you're saying just be yourself, but then you've been telling me all of these things that could be perceived differently, and how, what do you mean? How does that, how does that work? And one, one man, I love the way he phrased it. He's like, okay, it's like you're going to, you're going to France. If you go to France, you are not going to be understood if you just speak louder in English. You have to speak French. You don't have to be a different person. I thought that's a really good analogy. And it is truly, and we don't have to, but I do think it's in our best interest to understand how we're being heard, how what we're saying and doing is being perceived, and in some of those cases to learn how to speak that language so that we are perceived well and how what we're trying to get across is coming across in the way that we intended. But we don't have to be a different person. You don't have to change your personality. You don't have to change your values.